The member from Niagara Falls. Well, how you say that, Mr. Speaker? I'd like to rise today and talk about a moving event I went to last Tuesday. The event was the unveiling of the monument to our local Niagara Falls firefighters who lost their lives serving their community. Fire Chief John Shapton, Captain Harvey Lewis, Director of Training Ken Bassett, Firefighter Wayne Bench, Platoon Chief Harry Stroud, Firefighter Timothy Hoday, Firefighter David Weaver, and Captain John Shuttler. These are names of heroes who paid the ultimate price to keep our community safe, keep our families safe, and keep our children safe. There's never enough words to say thank you. We can do work together to make sure that those who came after them are fully protected. Some of these heroes lost their lives many years after they joined the service, some through cancers and other illness that have become part of the job. Mr. Speaker, I've been speaking up for working men and women my entire adult life. There's one thing I believe in my core. No person should ever, ever have to go to work and worry about not coming home or getting an illness that cuts their life short. We need to refocus our efforts on workers on health and safety. We need to make sure that every woman and man is protected in the workplace as we possibly can. If they do contact a workplace illness, we need to make sure that the province is there to provide for them and their family. These firefighters built our community, kept us safe, and I said we can never thank them enough, but we can all use our power as legislators to learn from these lessons and protect the future of generation of workers. Firefighters and their lost brothers and sisters will always, will always be family. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> member statement. The member from Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to highlight an event that happened in my riding on the 14th of September, which I think speaks volumes about our government's commitment to govern and consult with and for the people. Last Friday, Northumberland Peterborough South welcomed MPP and PA Michael Parsa and his team from the Ministry of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. They came down as a part of our government's cross-province consultation to discuss how unnecessary government regulation piled on by the previous government has restricted businesses' ability to grow and innovate and make life wantonly more difficult for the business community across Ontario. Our community really came together, Mr. Speaker, on this occasion, and over the course of the discussion, we had 36 businesses and community leaders gather at Venture 13 in Coburg, where they voiced their various concerns and provided excellent feedback. Their stories were truly remarkable. Folks, the phrase open for business is not just a slogan. We are taking tangible steps to make this province more competitive and create the conditions for economic opportunity. But, Mr. Speaker, it starts with listening. And the roundtable was an important first step in listening to the needs of Ontario businesses so we can understand as a government what more we can do to improve Ontario's economy. I'd like to thank MPP Michael Parsa for taking the time to come down and extend a special thanks to Wendy Curtis, CEO of Venture 13, and Paul Burnham, owner of Burnham Family Farms, for working with my office to put this great day on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Member statement, I recognize the member from Windsor, Tecumseh. Speaker, we lost a good friend down my way. Elizabeth Kishkon was a former mayor of Windsor, serving between 1983 and 1985. She was the first and so far the only woman to hold that office. She was born in Oshawa, but lived in London, England as a child and during the war years, spending much of her time in air raid shelters. As mayor, she wrote to the Queen in 1984 told her of her wartime experience, invited her to Windsor during her visit to Ontario that year. The Queen was impressed, and she and Prince Philip did indeed visit our fair city that summer. Elizabeth Kishkan was a great lady, the right mayor for the time. She used to be a broadcaster with the CBC radio in Windsor and get in a political life to fight against the proposed residential development on Pesh Island. She had a good sense of humor, a regal bearing and a trace of a British accent. She loved to visit her schools and speak to the kids. When she wore her chain of office, some of them asked if indeed she was the Queen. When she left office, Elizabeth was awarded a Doctor of Laws degree from the University of Windsor and was appointed to Ontario's Human Rights Commission. 
Just last year, our mayor and council named a park after Ms. Kishkan, and she was delighted with the gesture. It's just down the street from my home, and I think of Elizabeth every day. I drive past that large sign identifying Elizabeth Kishkan Park. To her family, I say thank you for your mother's service to our community. She was a role model for generations to come. Thank you. For the member statement, I recognize the member from Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to draw the attention of the Legislature to the path of destruction left behind by Typhoon Mankut, a Category 5 storm that tore through the Philippines, Hong Kong, Macau, and South China earlier this week. Many of the storm's most severe effects were felt in the Philippines, where the typhoon triggered massive landslides, floods, and collapses of buildings and structures. At least 74 people are now confirmed dead while dozens more remain missing and unaccounted for. Eglinton Lawrence is a diverse riding with a significant Filipino population. And many of my constituents have friends, family, and loved ones who have been directly or indirectly affected by the typhoon. As recovery and rescue operations continue, I would like to encourage my colleagues to join me in offering thoughts and prayers for the people impacted by Typhoon Mankut. I would also like to recognize and thank the great number of Canadian charities and non-governmental organizations that have mobilized their resources to help with rescue and recovery efforts following Typhoon Mankut. Your efforts have not gone unnoticed. I remember not too long ago there was Typhoon Haiyan, which hit the Philippines as well, and I spent a long time in the basement of uh, our Lady of Assumption Church, which is the Catholic uh, Center of Filipino Church in Canada, the Catholic Filipino Church in Canada, and we had a great time, even though it was a very difficult situation, packing up boxes for relief. So the Filipino community always manages to seem like a happy, contented community, but they have suffered quite a lot from typhoons. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further member statement. I recognize a member from Thunder Bay, Atacokan. I rise today to speak about the opioid crisis, which is killing more than three people across this province every day. In my area of Thunder Bay, the rate of opioid overdose is double the provincial average, with paramedics dealing with over 173 overdoses so far this year. Community partners have come together to address this crisis. Local nurse practitioner Tannis Fletcher Stackhouse at Northwest Community Health Care Centre says, in 20 years that I have been a nurse in this community of Thunder Bay, I have never seen a problem this bad. Yet in the North, we are desperately underserved, no health services providing supervised consumption, and not enough treatment spots. The regional hospital emergency services are wholly inadequate. Evidence shows that supervised consumption services save lives, help connect people to treatment, improve community safety, and save public funds in the long run. We urge the Minister of Health and this government to reverse their decision to put the planned overdose prevention site in Thunder Bay on hold. The community wants this site, let it open, give people the chance to connect with health and treatment services they so desperately need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statement, I recognize a member from Barrie, Springwater, Oramadante. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to bring attention to the 78th anniversary of the Battle of Britain. After the defeat of France in June 1940, the Germans attempted to dominate the skies over southern England. The German Luftwaffe had become the most formidable and largest air force in the world. Although a number of the British had excellent planes, they also used radar and they used outposts. They had people relaying information by radio. It was really the first time that, that they had deployed radar in, in uh, this sort of forum. There were a thousand observation posts. They made limited resources go a long ways. And throughout the summer and autumn of 1940, the Royal Air Force, which included the Royal Canadian Air Force, which is really why I'm speaking to this, the contingent hailed the words of the newly minted Prime Minister Winston Churchill when he said, Hitler knows that we will have to break us in this island or lose the war. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, 
This was their finest hour. Nearly 3,000 men took part in this pivotal moment of the war. 544 of them died. In addition to the 3,000 men, there were tens of thousands of volunteers assisting throughout the 1,000 observation posts. The German Luftwaffe was dealt a lethal blow from which it almost never fully recovered. This past Sunday, I took part in an anniversary parade in Barrie and had the opportunity to chat with Major General Romer, who took part in the liberation of France, Belgium, and Holland, completing 135 operational missions and was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. I thank the Major General for his part in making it possible for protecting the institutions like this legislature we stand in today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Further member statement, a member from Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my mother had a stroke last Thursday. And I want to thank all of my colleagues and the many others for their kind words and notes. The good news is mom has graduated to the seventh floor and is recovering and getting ready for rehab. So, Speaker, I have, I have a few thanks, so I'll try to get through them here. I, I'd like to thank the manager at Farm, Farm Boy and the woman who helped my sister Steph and mom. I'd like to thank the paramedics who got my mom to the hospital quickly the whole team at the Civic Campus of the Ottawa Hospital and the Heart Institute. A special thanks to the Neurology Acute Care Unit for their professional and compassionate care. They all should know that their combined efforts put my mom on the right path, and we're very grateful. So, Speaker, when a loved one is sick, nothing else matters. Nothing. And one of the most important reasons people send us here is to ensure that our publicly funded health care system will be there for us. And it was for us. Speaker, there's been a lot of conflict in this House in the last couple of weeks. And being away and looking at this, it just reminded me that we must never lose our focus on what's most important for those people that we serve. And again, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Further member statements, the member from the Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. Residents of Nickel Belt and Sudbury and communities beyond are concerned by the signal they are receiving from the Ford government in relation to the continued four-laning on Highway 69. Last week, the Sudbury Chamber of Commerce wrote to the Premier to express their concern that the Premier's line-by-line -line audit and the possibility it will cancel funds already committed to finish the four-laning of Highway 69. Speaker, Highway 69 is the connective artery between Sutton and Orton, Ontario. Commuters come, uh, come south, while uh, business people and tourists come north. Unfortunately, Highway 69 remains very dangerous. It was designed at a time when the majority of commercial and industrial freight were carried by rail. In 2018, most freight is carried by tractor trailer in the name of speed and efficiency. Unfortunately, that speed and efficiency is lost when something goes wrong on this stretch of highway. When something goes wrong, Speaker, it goes really wrong. The routine closures of Highway 69 due to collision adds hundreds of kilometers and several hours of detours, not to mention the tragic loss of life. Too many Northerners citizens have lost their lives on this two-lane stretch of road. In Nickel Belt and Sudbury, everybody knows someone who has died or had an accident on Highway 69. To prevent further loss of life, we need to make sure that the money is there to finish the four-laning of Highway 69. The sooner the better. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Further member statement, I recognize a member from Oakville North. Burlington. Thank, thank you, Speaker. Um, Ontario's professional engineers are vital to the success of our province. They build our cities and infrastructure and make sure that, they build, that, that what they build is built well and built safe. Just last week, on September the 13th, I was honoured to be able to present final certificates to engineers from Oakville North Burlington who are about to enter the profession in Ontario. I had the pleasure to address the Oakville chapter of the Professional Engineers of Ontario, where engineers from my riding and neighbouring ridings in the Halton region received their certificates, and what a diverse bunch of new Ontario engineers. 
everyone from new graduates from our great universities to new immigrants to Canada receiving their Canadian credentials. I know that they will make a significant contribution to Ontario and its future, and I'm proud to be part of a government that will ensure their future will be one of personal success and prosperity. Under the leadership of our Premier, we will build an economy that will work, will need the work of engineers like the ones I met last week, and they can help us rebuild Ontario's crumbling infrastructure. To each of the new professional engineers who received their certificates last week, congratulations. I wish you much success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Further member statements. I recognize the member from Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was my pleasure to make an announcement on Monday morning on behalf of the Minister of Transportation, the Honourable John Yakabaski, on the opening of a brand new drive to centre in Mississauga. Joined by my colleague, MPP for Mississauga, Aaron Mills, I toured the facility, which will service over 300,000 customers annually and increase the capacity within our system. With 25 kiosks, accessible examination technology, and tests available in over 25 languages, this new Mississauga location is now the largest drive test centre in Ontario and has created about 40 new full-time jobs. We have also launched a new Ontario Drive app to help prepare new drivers for their G1 written test and improve accessibility overall. Thank you to the staff for a warm and informative visit. Our government is excited to get Ontario moving. Thank you very much. All right.